Hi, in this video we will cover hyperparameter tuning. The key agendas are understand what are hyperparameters, why hyperparameter tuning is important, we'll look at a good example, multiple examples, and we'll see what are the right approaches to search for the hyperparameters, and in that context we'll look at both exhaustive search in this part, and in the subsequent part we'll also look at uh, Bayesian optimization and generic algorithm. One thing we'll definitely cover in this uh, video is uh, what are the mathematical advantages of random search over grid search. Then we'll understand uh, which method to use, whether it is grid search, random search, Bayesian optimization, or genetic algorithm. And that has to be dependent on the scenario, so you're going to cover that along with a case study in part 4. So let's get started. What is an hyperparameter? So hyperparameters are parameters of a model that define the model's architecture that do not change with your model training and also they are not learned as part of training so those are the three important attributes that define what a hyperparameters are another very important thing to also note is that hyperparameters are different for each of the models so each model has its own set of hyperparameters and let us quickly see some examples so for linear models the degree of polynomial which defines the linear fit. The max depth and minimum number of leaves are hyperparameters for addition tree. The number of trees and the number of features to use when you are building the tree are also hyperparameters for random forest. The number of layers and number of neurons are hyperparameters for a neural network. And then when it comes to optimizers, optimizer itself is a hyperparameter for neural network, but optimizers themselves have uh, hyperparameters such as learning rate and momentum. Why is hyperparameter tuning important? This is probably one of the most important takeaways from this video is that you have to find an optimal solution and for that hyperparameters are the key. In general you will be in a space where there are many local minimas and your interest is to find the global minima. When you want to find the right capacity for your solution again hyperparameter tuning is very important so this is where you're going to be optimizing between an overfit versus an underfit. When you want to find ideal architectures, so architectures for cloud is going to be different from architectures for edge computing, again hyperparameters are going to make a big difference. Your speed of convergence when you're training so and the path of convergence for your model is also dependent on hyperparameter and we're going to see an example today in this video when we showcase how speed of convergence changes with respect to the optimizers. Finally, when you want to generalize your models for production, you want to regularize those parameters and parameters of the models which are the hyperparameters are important for generalizing your model for production. An important takeaway from this slide is the model outputs will have a drastic change based on how you choose your hyperparameters. And to prove this point we're going to see a couple of examples below. First let's understand how capacity can be changed by changing neurons for a neural network. So here is my simple architecture where I have one layer of inputs, another one is an output layer, and in my particular case I have chosen a 100 class classification which means there will be 100 neurons for the output layer and I'm going to be varying the number of input layer neurons which is my hyperparameter that I'm tuning. So input layer neuron count is my hyperparameter. Now when I choose input layer count to be 1, which is only one hyper one neuron is there, for an output neuron count of 100, which is a 100 class classification, we are looking at uh, three charts. The first chart is our accuracy was the box, which is fundamentally giving us an idea of how the accuracy, both training accuracy and the validation accuracy are moving with respect to box. And then the second chart in green is indicating to us convergence between how the training accuracy and the validation accuracy are converging within themselves. And the third one is our loss convergence, so uh, this particularly indicates over a set of epochs how is my loss converging which means ideally we want to see some convergence more or more close to zero. So let us see this this particular case where input layer neuron is equal to 1. What we see is the epochs versus accuracy chart is showing as an accuracy of 1.3% so absolutely nothing has been learned which is here and our convergence properties between training and validation is all over the place and our loss convergence is only having a loss divergence as the number of epochs increase. So this indicates to us that this is not an ideal setup for the given configuration or a given problem. Next we are going to change the input number of neurons and see the outputs. So when we change the input number of neurons to 3, what we see is that epochs versus accuracy now is starting to show some improvement. So I'm seeing an overall accuracy improvement of 24%. The validation was the training accuracy again has got some more smoothness in its convergence. 
and our loss convergence properties have also improved indicating that this is it's only got better when I had increased the number of input neurons from 1 to 3 so we are now again going to change and increase the number of input neurons and this time we're going to increase it to a count of 6 and when we change it to count of 6 immediately we can see that the epoch versus accuracy chart is indicating to us the overall accuracy is 90 percent so now we have really learned a lot about the problem which is a classification problem in this case and our convergence chart has become much much more smoother and our loss accuracies are significantly showing good convergence properties next we are going to again further increase the number of neuron counts this time we make the neuron count to be 9 and what we see is it has now achieved an accuracy of 100 percent with a very smooth convergence for validation and training accuracy and our loss convergence are also extremely well behaved but one thing very important to note is here our accuracy has reached 1.0 which is 100 percent so it is literally overfitting our existing problem so one of the things as part of hyperparameter configuration that we have to choose is not necessarily those that are overfitting or as extremely high accuracy scores for both training and validation but something that would be more ideally in a territory between the high accuracy scores that we can receive and the overfit situation so we have to find hyperparameters which will be in this case between a neuron count of 6 which gives me 90% accuracy and a neuron count of 9 which gives me 100% accuracy so our goal with hyperparameter tuning is to take a set of top 3 or 4 hyperparameter values which will help us find the sweet spot the important takeaway from the slide is finding the solution that does not overfit is, is critical is important only that way we can regularize the models next let's take a look at another example where we are going to talk about speed of convergence this time we are going to be optimizing using different optimizers so what we are trying to do is hyperparameter search for different optimizers and this chart basically indicates to us the various contours in our solution space and each of these lines are different performances of optimizers so SGD is to cast gradient descent momentum is momentum optimizer NAG is Nestrov optimizer, Adagrad, Ada Delta, Armas Prop are respective optimizers. And in this particular picture, this star is the global minima that we are interested in reaching. And this was the starting point for our overall optimization. So this is the starting point of the parameters and how the solution space was traversed and path was traversed by different optimizers as they come over and reach the global minima. Now what we obviously can see very clearly is there are some optimizers like Adagrad and Armas Prop actually reach here faster than a stochastic gradient descent or a momentum and that is inherently built because of the way those particular optimizers are being mathematically driven so their mathematical algorithms are the key reason why the slowness is there and which paths they choose so that I've covered it separately in our optimizer uh, video but right now what we are interested in is to understand how we should configure our hyperparameter so that the speed of convergence during training is is high and optimum and this is one of those examples okay so now now that we've seen two examples that convince us the importance and the need for hyperparameter optimization let us quickly turn our attention to searching for good hyperparameters the first method is the most simplest method which is an exhaustive search method called grid search there are four steps in grid search the first one is we define all the possible values for grid search what it does is it fundamentally goes out and sequentially evaluates each possible value within our solution space so each of the values is now being evaluated in the dots for hyperparameter X and hyperparameter Y and this particular chart is showing us the solution space of how or where the global maximas are for the given X and given Y okay so the first step is we define the range of possible values for all the hyperparameters next we sequentially take each value in a combination evaluate the performance of the model then we do a cross validation so after we evaluate the performance of the model for a particular data set we have to cross validate it to ensure that there is no data bias for this particular hyperparameter finally we'll pick the top end performing hyperparameters that are working well for our data after the cross validation usually it is three or four depending on your need so this is sequential 
in nature and it is time consuming and not only is it time consuming grid search is going to try and evaluate each point which might or might not be useful so we're going to turn our attention to the second method which is the random search method so here what happens is again there are four steps first we define a random sampling space and when we define a random sampling space we either can give an explicit set of values like how we gave it for uh, grid search or we can specify continuous distributions from which sampling can happen and the second step is it is going to sample the hyperparameters randomly based on the explicit values or continuous distributions that we have given then it is going to evaluate the model for each of the randomly sampled hyperparameter then it is going to do a cross validation we have to pick the top n performing hyperparameters where n is usually 3. Let us quickly summarize the difference between grid versus random search. So a grid search is going to try all combinations exhaustively whereas a random search only tries n number of combinations from a given hyperparameter space. The hyperparameter values need to be passed in for the grid search whereas for random search you can either pass in the values or the value range or you can give it a distribution from which it will make the sampling. For grid search, the third important point is it takes very long time if your solution space is huge and this is one of the demerits of grid search. And then for random search, it can operate irrespective of the size of your solution space because we are going to provide it the inputs as to how many times we want the random sampling happened. So irrespective of how huge your solution space is, random sampling consistently has the same performance. One more point important to note is why random search is efficient than grid search. First is random search is non-sequential sampling. So it is going to be sampling but and is not going to do a sequential search nor is it going to be doing exhaustively for all data points. Second, random sampling does not give equal importance to every hyperparameter combination. So if you think about it deeply, not every combination of hyperparameters is important really in our solution space and that is also the case when we run with random search random search does not give equal importance and there is a mathematical edge also let us say we are five percent away from the true optimal value so we found a range where we are five percent away from a true optimal value then it can be shown mathematically that the number of iterations needed by a random search which uses random sampling to reach the optimum point which is only five percent away the number of trials needed is only six this particular formula helps us evaluate the number of trials needed for us to be able to reach a 95% confidence of reaching the, the true optimal point. Implementations in sklearn are done via two functions. One is called a grid search CV. The grid search CV takes parameters which are estimator parameters. So the estimator parameter is indicating to us the model that we want to use that we have already done the fit for. Then the param grid is basically going to be helping us understand how we want or what is the range of values we want for each of the hyperparameters. So for example, the parameter grid would be configured like this, where we have set for a tree model. The maximum depth is e is 3, comma none, indicating to us that we want to go from 0 to 3. So this CV parameter is a cross-validation parameter that takes in an input of integer for the k in a k-fold cross-validation. The verbose controls the verbosity of the model, and the scoring is basically you, helps you give you a a sample scoring method. And the random search CV function differs only with two important parameters. Rest of all the parameters are similar to grid search CV. The random search param distributions is the distribution key for which we will be passing in different distributions, whether whether we want to pass it Gaussian distributions, T distributions, whatever those functions of distributions are, we can pass in here. And then the n iter basically determines the number of times we want the random search CV to run sampling within our solution space. The next part is Bayesian optimization and here we'll take a deep dive in understanding how Bayesian optimization mathematics work with an example and then look at how to search using a Bayesian optimization.